Well, we are in Luke 13, so please turn in your Bibles there. We've come to the last section of this chapter. It seems like we've been in it uh, a while, what with uh, Easter's and, and different holidays in my absence, but uh, a dominant theme is going to begin to coalesce in these verses as uh, the purpose of Jesus' ministry uh, comes into clearer focus. Uh, the verses find uh, Jesus and his disciples traveling in the north, uh, in the regions of Galilee and Perea. <clears throat> the gospel writers describe uh, something of a preaching campaign with Jesus uh, proclaiming, they tell us in different places, the good news of the kingdom of God. The truth of what he was saying uh, was repeatedly attested by his miracles, and despite significant opposition, uh, many of the massive crowds trailing after him were showing a kind of willingness uh, to follow him, but the vast majority of these people, it becomes apparent, had no idea uh, what that might entail, just like we didn't when we uh, became disciples of Christ. And so Jesus would plead with them, as we saw in our last lesson, to strive uh, to enter through the narrow door that leads to the kingdom, that leads to forgiveness and eternal life. And as the days passed, the urgency of his message increased, and his tenor uh, became uh, more and more one of warning. Unbeknownst to those listening to him, his time was running short. Though it may have seemed to many that this, his travel itinerary was random, uh, Luke has dropped hints as to his ultimate destination, beginning uh, with chapter 9 and verse 51, with the advisement that Jesus had set his face to go to Jerusalem. And continuing uh, in this chapter, 13, in verse 22, with the more nuanced uh, observation that he was proceeding on his way to Jerusalem. And Luke will continue with these occasional references, including in the passage we're studying today. So let's read it, uh, beginning in verse uh, 31 of Luke 13. Just at that time, some Pharisees approached, saying to him, go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, go and tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow and the third day I reach my goal. Nevertheless, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next Day, for it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate, and I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A quotation, as most of you know, from that Messianic Psalm, Psalm 118. Early in our nation's history, uh, two explorers, uh, undertook uh, the most momentous journey. Uh, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark, uh, close friends and experienced adventurers, were sent by Thomas Jefferson to traverse the newly obtained Louisiana Purchase and then to find a practical route across the western half of the continent to the Pacific Ocean. But what motivated them was insatiable curiosity uh, the mystery of the unknown, and dreams of renown. What characterized the journey was adventure, uh, the thrill of discovery, uh, the romantic passion of their mission, and incredible bravery. 
Jefferson wrote of Meriwether Lewis, of courage undaunted, possessing a firmness and perseverance of purpose which nothing but impossibilities could divert from its direction, careful as a father of those committed to his charge, with all these qualifications as if selected and implanted by nature in one body for this express purpose, I could have no hesitation in confiding the enterprise to him. Stephen Ambrose, a popular historian, wrote an historical novel about the mission entitling it Undaunted Courage. Many of you have read it, it certainly was uh, courageous, uh, the story will rivet you. But no exhibition of courage ever matched the journey Jesus Christ made from the throne of heaven down to earth as God incarnate and fearlessly forward to the cross of Calvary. His motivation was divine and fueled by love. His goal was to fulfill the mission his father had set him upon to secure a people for himself, a kingdom of priests whom God would adopt into his family for eternal fellowship and the rendering of glory uh, to his name. What characterized the journey were humility, verity, compassionate and sacrificial love, and the courage to neither say nor do anything that was not in accordance with the mission he had chosen to accept, which was to offer his sinless life unto death as the sinners do. And we see that undaunted courage in our passage today out of Luke 13, as the Lord eyes uh, the city of Jerusalem with a mix of anguish and determination and though events conspired in God's providence to bring him there, it was that determination that made it certain. His enemies, uh, the Pharisees, were God's instruments in the conspiracy, as was Herod Antipas. Uh, though the relationship between the two was hostile, they nevertheless found common ground in their antipathy toward Jesus. Uh, Luke introduces the scene by indicating that it was just at that time, uh, that is, just after he had pointedly spoken in verses 28 through 30 of the first being the last and of the judgment of hell prepared for many who were convinced that they were on the side of the righteous. And that would have enraged these Jewish leaders. Uh, but that was not apparent on the surface, as Luke reports introducing the scene, when some Pharisees approached Jesus, saying to him, Go away, leave here, for Herod wants to kill you. The first question that comes to mind for me was why? Why uh, would those naturally hostile to him, the Pharisees, uh, seek to help him? Are we to take at face value what they put forth, that they want to protect him from harm? Or were they simply lying? Uh, this was a fabrication, in other words, to manipulate him and use the threat of danger to get him to leave the region over which Herod had jurisdiction, Perea and Galilee, and move back south into Judea. Or perhaps it was Herod himself who had planted the idea. He was the one, after all, who had had John the Baptist uh, killed, an unpopular move for a tetrarch who sought more than anything for tranquility in the region that he ruled. Uh, back in chapter 9, around verses 7, and, and right in that part of chapter 9, Luke had previously reported on Herod's interest in Jesus. He was perplexed, Luke says, about what he had heard about him. So it might actually have been Herod using the Pharisees to rid his provinces of, of Jesus. But the Pharisees had their own motivation for wishing that Jesus would leave and go to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was their turf. 
and they had more power and influence there, so they could have been in collusion with Herod uh, to move him that way, uh, hiding behind Herod's motives to accomplish their own. So who was using whom? However we interpret it, the question uh, the, is almost irrelevant. For Jesus was not one to listen to human advice. He had a counselor uh, they did not know. So the Lord, as was his custom, took control of the conversation. He said to them in verse 32, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I reach my goal. Whatever the conspiracy between Herod and the Pharisees, Jesus now indulges them in their deceit. He has a message for them to deliver to that fox, Herod. It was an unusual way to refer to him, fox, uh, though appropriate. Uh, in Jewish literature, much like in our own literature, the fox typically represented a sly and cunning behavior. You sly fox, you. Uh, and that was truly sure, uh, uh, truly, surely true of Herod. But it may have been also that the Lord, uh, conscious of himself as the lion of David, enjoyed a bar, but no one else understood. The true roles were the reverse of what was thought, and in the end, the lion would devour the fox. However he meant it, it was a contemptuous way of referring to him. Leon Morse observed in his commentary that Herod is the only person Jesus is recorded as having treated with contempt. I read that and I thought, okay. The only person reported as Jesus treating with contempt. And later in his gospel, uh, in chapter 23, after Jesus' arrest, uh, when Herod called for Jesus and questioned him, uh, Luke provides the damning report that Jesus answered him nothing. And Morris concluded, when Jesus has nothing to say to a man, that man's position is hopeless. But the message he has for Herod, and, and really for the Pharisees as well, is fascinating. Uh, he uses what was a common Semitism in both verses 32 and 33. Today, tomorrow, and the third day, or as in verse 33, today, tomorrow, and the next. The meaning is that his activity, in, in this case, uh, the obvious uh, marks of his messiahship, healing people and casting out demons, uh, that activity will continue to be his activity, but it will not continue indefinitely. The third day is the figurative end of the time period. Now, a lot of people have read, it, some people have read into this some reference to three days in the tomb. I don't think that's it. It's a common uh, way, a Semitic way of, of speaking. The present opportunity, in other words, is inevitably short. Uh, furthermore, when it ends, uh, will not be Herod's call, but instead will be according to a divine timetable determined by the Father in concert with the Son. Jesus would be no unwitting or unwilling martyr dragged pitifully to his death and helpless to forestall it. It would be a voluntary sacrifice in accordance with his full volition. Uh, that was what he said, remember, in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Uh, the Father uh, loves him, he said then, because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And that agrees with what he says here. Uh, note carefully uh, the closing phrase of verse uh, 32. The third day, I reach my goal. The verb reach my goal means uh, something like it will be completed or be perfected. 
Uh, J.B. Phillips translated, my work will be finished. It's both a, a fulfillment and a termination. Herod is sadly and wildly misguided. No one will be killing Jesus until Jesus reaches his goal. So if Herod is interested in killing Jesus, he better get to Jerusalem. For it is Jerusalem that dominates the Lord's mental horizon. We know what it means to have our mental horizon dominated by something. Sometimes it's something good, sometimes it's something bad. Uh, for Jesus, it was the most monumental thing, Jerusalem, dominated his thinking. And that's seen now in verse 33, where Jesus states plainly the necessity of continuing on the divinely designed plan to fulfill his journey to the end, because that will not come about, but it occurs in Jerusalem. It has been mapped out beforehand, uh, the timing, the route, the destination, and there would be no wavering or dissuading. And so the idiom is repeated, I must journey on today and tomorrow and the next day. The time of arrival is appointed and he is destined to accomplish it at the right moment. Also at the right place, uh, Jerusalem was the heart of the nation, historically the place where God chose to engage most actively and personally with his people. The nation's uh, dismal destiny and that of its prophets would always be played out there, uh, which was cruelly and strangely ironic, for it had been uh, from the beginning characterized as a city dear to the heart of God. And Luke, I'd like to comment on Luke in distinction from some of the other gospel writers, because they each have their own style, and part of an exercise of studying a gospel is making note of those things. But uh, of all the synoptic gospel writers, Luke seemed to have been especially aware of the importance of Jerusalem. He includes its name, Jerusalem, 90 times in his gospel, and while the name appears only 49 other times in the whole uh, New Testament. It was, it was there that the prophets uh, were put on trial including Jesus himself, and, and there that the people's final opposition to God would be put on display, and there the place where Jesus would die. It's the theme of the entire section here of the gospel. Only there would Jesus share in the fate of God's prophets of old, and so uh, we read the ironical observation of Jesus, Luke provides, it cannot be that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. That is, it's not possible. It simply would not do. And Peter, uh, the apostle, would later uh, pray after it had all been accomplished and after he himself had endured the inquisition of the Sanhedrin, he would later pray in Acts 4, 27, for truly in this city, that's what he says in his prayer, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus' route to Jerusalem was God's route, and he took it selflessly. There were opportunities to journey another way. Satan had tempted him to every other direction his evil mind could conjure. Uh, in Gethsemane, he felt perhaps the full weight of the burden he carried, making desperate supplication to his father that if there be any other way, uh, that cup of destiny might somehow pass him by. 
But as the Apostle Paul would write one day in Philippians 2, he emptied himself of any such prerogative as that. And he undertook as a real human being to stay the course of obedience right up to and through the point of death, even death on a cross. And Jesus' words uh, recorded here by Luke are to be understood against that backdrop. I must journey on, for it, it would never do that a prophet would perish outside of Jerusalem. Like Isaac, uh, with his father Abraham, carrying the wood upon his own back up Mount Moriah, knowing where the journey would lead and what the destination would mean, Jesus journeyed on. Undaunted courage. And as Jefferson wrote of Meriwether Lewis, careful as a father of those committed to his charge, surrendering to every need of others along the way. That he did all the way. Mother, behold your son. Son, behold your mother. Well, in the final two verses, uh, the thought of Jesus' death as a prophet in Jerusalem turns his thoughts to what Jerusalem represented or symbolized the spirit or attitude of the people as a whole. And it leads him to a, a passionate soliloquy that is, I'd say, famous uh, in, in amongst Christians. This soliloquy expressing his sad dismay over the continual rejection of God's uh, ceaseless outreach to them and of his passionate longing that their desire would have matched his. Now he could only pronounce judgment upon the house which he would abandon. It would become a house with no occupants. He would not be seen there again until the fulfillment of the hope of the second coming of Christ. So we find Jesus here exclaiming tenderly, if there is such a thing, only from the lips of Jesus could one exclaim tenderly, but he does, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. In his humanity, he finds it difficult to constrain himself, uh, foreshadowing here the imminent occasion of the triumphal entry in Luke 19, verse 41, when he will approach the city for the final time and weep over it. More than once, the incarnate Son of God would shed tears, tears over the city and over its inhabitants. Now Luke, again, more than the other gospel writers, seems to take note of these moments. Uh, back in chapter 9 and verse 36, as Jesus was going through the cities and the villages, carrying on his ministry of teaching and healing, and casting out demons. Uh, seeing the people, Luke writes, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited like sheep without a, a shepherd. So this is an evidence of his humanity because if you think upon it, uh, God, the Father who is immutable, is not subject to the rise and fall and change of emotions. The, Expressions of emotion attributed to God the Father by the prophetic writers were something like anthropomorphisms. But Christ was both God and a true man. And as he did at the tomb of Lazarus, in the face of the ravages of sin and Satan's violence against humanity, he would be overcome with grief and even weep. Uh, the depth of his love and compassion can be seen in its objects. The Jerusalem of his, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, is the city that kills the prophets and stones those God sends to it. For example, the author of 2 Kings uh, wrote of wicked King Manasseh of Judah, uh, how he shed very much innocent blood until he had filled Jerusalem from one end to another, 2 Kings 21, 16. 
in Jeremiah 26, uh, verses 20 and following, uh, record how the godly prophet Uriah, son of Shemaiah, uh, was slain with a sword by King Jehoiakim for prophesying in a like manner as the great Jer Jer Jeremiah. And we could, look, we could rattle these off. It, it would take too much time. Uh, several, many more if needed. Jesus could not have spoken more truly about how Jerusalem historically had killed and stoned the prophets God had sent. And how he knew uh, that sad practice was soon to reach its climax in the city's final violent rejection of him. Uh, the venom of those who hate him uh, stands now in sharp contrast to Jesus' own compassion and his desire to gather them up instead in his loving arms, uh, beautifully illustrated now by Jesus with the image of a mother hen uh, gathering her brood under uh, her protective wings in order to save them uh, from danger. It is only there under his wings that one may find safety, sustenance, and the sense of belonging uh, critical to a fulfilled life. And there are so many of you here, uh, I know, uh, who have learned and experienced that. Uh, no matter what external malevolent forces uh, may threaten you, uh, you know that under the wings of the living God, uh, wrapped up in the arms of Christ, you're immune to any kind of ultimate disaster. Such a beautiful image he gives us. An article in National Geographic several years ago uh, provided a, a really good image of the wings of Jesus. I read this several years ago, I think during seminary. I keep this file, you know, of all these things in there piled up with little cards, but this was a true story. After a forest fire in Yellowstone National Park, forest rangers began hiking around the park to assess the damage from the fire. And one ranger found this bird little, literally uh, petrified in ashes, uh, perched like a statue on the ground under a tree, at the base of a tree. And he, he knocked over the dead bird with a a stick, and when he struck it, three tiny chicks uh, scurried under their dead, scurried out from under their dead mother's wings. So this loving mother, aware of the disaster that was coming, had, had carried her offspring to the base of the tree and had gathered them under her wings, and instinctively knowing that the toxic smoke would uh, rise. She could have flown herself uh, to safety, but had refused to abandon her little babies. And when the blaze arrived and the heat had scorched her little body, the mother had remained steadfast because she had been willing to die. Uh, those under the cover of her wings would live. And that's the picture that Jesus offers now. But as with the prophets of old, what Jesus often had offered uh, to God's chosen people, uh, they repeatedly rejected. They refused his loving care. Look at this sad clash of wills that capsulizes how sin has always corrupted God's original design. It's encapsulated inside the 34th verse. I wanted, I wanted you would not have it. Those are the same Greek verbs. We don't have to go into that in any detail, but they are the same. And so we might helpfully translate this, I wanted it, you wanted it not. To the man, Jesus, it must have been a, a fitting snapshot of what had tra transpired for centuries in his experience as the eternal son of God, the tragic disjunction between God's preceptive will that the people would respond to him in obedience and his decretive will 
that ordained their sinful obstinacy. Isaiah portrayed one side of it in Isaiah chapter 65, uh, giving voice to God who says, I said, here am I, here am I to a nation which did not call on my name. I have spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in the way which is not got good, following their own thoughts, <clears throat> people who continually provoke me to my face. And that's one side of it, his preceptive will that people will respond to him and come to him. But his decretive will stands out in an earlier chapter of Isaiah, chapter 6, where Isaiah is commanded by the Lord to go and tell the people of Israel, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of this people insensitive, their ears dull and their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. God is perfectly sovereign and completely capable of bringing about whatever he wishes, but the making known of his preceptive will will increase the guilt of those who ultimately reject him. All of mankind deserves God's condemnation. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That's Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. And yet God declares in Ezekiel 18.23 that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, rather that he should turn from his ways and live. It's in the same spirit of how Paul concluded that Romans 6.23 verse, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. All day long, uh, God holds out his hands, uh, wanting, we can say, that men and women would come to him. Uh, here in our passage, Jesus acknowledges that. And, and though it, in context, is restricted to Jerusalem and its historical inhabitants, it gives a fitting picture of the unbelieving world's rejection of the universal call of God. He has wanted, they have wanted not. But many have wanted and are still wanting. This room is filled with people who wanted. Uh, the number of those who enter through the narrow door are many, uh, more than the stars in the sky, the sea, sands on the seashore, uh, we read it in our last lesson, John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and all who come to me I will certainly not cast out. There will be no unwilling who are the objects of the irresistible grace of God. But lastly, in verse 35, we see the result of the continual refusals. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's a quotation, I said it earlier, out of the Messianic Psalm 118, uh, spoken prophetically. Follow me here. He's spoken prophetically by Jesus now at this moment. But you might recall it's repeated exactly in Matthew 23, verses 37 through 39, as the Lord's final judgment upon Israel right before he departed the temple in Jerusalem, taking God's glory with him and leaving it desolate. The city and its temple were ultimately destroyed by the Romans in A.D. 68 through 70. It can only be a prophecy of Messiah's second coming. Uh, when Christ returns upon the clouds of glory, uh, many of the Jewish 
race will have come to understand that Jesus is the Christ. Their eyes will have been opened to the truth behind the Bible's <clears throat> messianic prophecies, and every eye will see him, as Revelation 1-7 says. All uncertainty will be removed, and the triumph of our great conqueror will be manifest in all its glory, Christ the victor, Christ the king. Kit Hughes concluded his remarks on this passage by writing, Jesus is the hero of our souls. I like that. Jesus is the hero of our souls. He fully understood what lay ahead and faced it fully as every step drew him closer to death. Jesus was determined to die for our sins. He would not be deterred, and that determination was grounded in his tender love for his people. And his passion to save inevitably demands a response. Uh, there can be no uh, not voting, no I abstain, no nolo contendere, is that it? <laughs> All day long, he holds out his hands, imploring sinners to believe he is the Savior and that he gave himself in death to secure their forgiveness. He set his face like flint to go to Jerusalem, and he reached his goal, uh, the journey complete. It never gets old uh, to recount that, uh, to remember it, and find our hearts uh, overflowing uh, with gladness. What blessed people we are. Jesus is our hero. Uh, that's, that's why we're here. Let me pray. We're so grateful, Lord, that you love us the way that you have and do and that you have uh, found a way, a divine way, uh, to bring forgiveness to us. We who could not have earned forgiveness on our own, but your perfect Son could, infinitely holy, all-knowing, the courageous Jesus who set his face to, to go to Jerusalem and would not be denied to meet his sacrifice there. We're grateful. May we wear that uh, in our countenance, in our speech, uh, in our relations with the world, the, the people that we come into contact uh, week by week and give testimony to a Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.